of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Turn in your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want to read the entire chapter. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And uh, you can follow along on the screen if you're present or they'll on, if you're watching, the, the Scriptures will be there. If you will, out of respect, if you can, stand to your feet. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. Paul speaking to the church at Corinth. He says this, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long, it is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, Believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. And now abide faith, hope, Love These three, but the greatest of these is love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. Lord, that opens our hearts, if we will believe, for a transformation from the inside out. I thank You for Your love. It is Your love that initiated all other love. Lord, You loved us first. That's why we can love You in return. Lord, I ask You today to open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, and open our hearts to see the reality of Your love and to be transformed by Your love and to be carriers of Your love to the world around us. And Father, we thank You for Your Holy Spirit who is our Helper. Help me today to speak these words in a way that will mean something significant to those who listen and be transformed, not by my words, but by that which the Holy Spirit speaks. And Lord, I pray that today that You will draw the lost to You. Lord, those on their way to hell, Lord, today that they will call on the name of the Lord that they might be saved. For those who are backslidden to understand it is your love that's drawing them home. For those who are hurting and going through difficult times, Lord, to know that you care. And Lord, your love is there. Lord, we give you the thanks and praise for all that you will do through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The title of the message today is Love, the King of Virtues. Love, the King of Virtues. Now, everybody talks about love. Everybody sings about love. One of the things, if you turn on the radio and listen to your favorite radio station, doesn't matter whether it's country, western, or rock and roll, or some 
other kind of rap or whatever. A lot of people are talking about love. And love gets a lot of airtime. People want to find love. People want to experience love. Some of you can remember back in 1967 when the Beatles released their song, Love is All You Need. Love is all you need. And you know, a lot of people were identifying that. There was a generation that were tired of war. They were tired of hypocrisy. And they were tired of many things. And they were, there was a generation of young people at that time that were you know, on drugs and alcohol. And they were just letting themselves go because in this world, nothing seemed to matter except finding love. Finding love. Well, 2014, Ricky Lee released her song, All We Need Is Love. Then in 2016, Jennifer Lopez, Love Makes the World Go Round. You know, a lot of people singing about love, talking about love. Well, if love is all you need, and if love is what makes the world go round, if love is the, the main ingredient, the question then is, what is love? What is love? So many people are looking for love, but they're looking for love in all the wrong places, as the song says. They're trying to find love in a relationship. They're trying to find love in, in a person, an experience. Only to be disappointed, to be heartbroken, and to give up on love, and then they just live for the moment. But there is a love that will chase you down. There is a love that will seek you out. There is a love that will change your life. And that love comes from God. We're going to talk about love. What is love? Is it an emotion? Is it a romantic feeling? Is it a physical attraction? Is it a preference? Just think of all the different ways we use the word love. People say, I love ice cream. I love my new truck. I love my new dress. I love my job. I love to fish. I love my dog. And by the way, I love you too. I mean, how do you put love between an individual and another individual into the context of what love really is when we use love in so many different ways? Well, part of it is our English language. English language only has one word for love, and that's love. But the Bible was written in Greek. Now, I'm not going to give you a Greek lesson today, but I am going to tell you there are four different words that are used in the Greek language. Three of them are used in the Bible. The first one is eros. We get the word erotic from it. That describes sexual, physical love. And for it to have its true meaning, it has to have in the ingredients of the other kinds of love. There is another word, storge. Now that one's not used in the Bible, but it means an affection as in family love. The, the love that you would have for your children, the love that you would have in marriage, the love that you would have as a family. But to, it too has to be mixed with some other kinds of love. Then there is a word that is used in the New Testament called phileo. Phileo. We get the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Phileo means brotherly love or friendship love, companionship. When you have a best friend that you just love to hang out with. It's the kind of love that we should have for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. That brotherly love. But there is another word that is used to describe the love of God. And that is the Greek word agapao. Agapao. We sometimes call it agape. And that kind of love is different. That kind of love is not based upon whether people treat you right. It's not based upon whether you deserve it or not. It is a willful kind of love. It believes that every person is valuable and precious in the sight of God. Whether it is the most loving person or whether it's the person on skid row. The person that is the highest in moral character or the person that everybody says is the devil themselves. 
It is that kind of love that sees that God made them, God loves them, and they are valuable and precious in the sight of God. Thus, it is a kind of love that's by choice, not by feeling. Not by feeling. It is a kind of love that looks beyond the faults and the failures, and it looks for the good in other people. It looks for what is the precious in their soul. Jesus died for sinners. Jesus died for me. Now, you may not like me, but the thing is, Jesus loves me. We sing that song growing up in church, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. They are weak, but He is strong. Sing the chorus. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. How do we know? The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me. And the good news is He loves you. And He loves the people around us that we don't love. Because the value that He placed upon us is seen in the cross. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, it's the love of God that I'm talking about. Love, the King of virtues. Now there's lots of virtues, kindness, gentleness, self-control. All of these different virtues that we could list here today, and they're all good and they're all needed, and they're all a part of the Spirit's work in our life. But the greatest of all virtues is God's love. Love. But God doesn't want it to just remain His love. He wants us to be able to receive His love, to be changed by His love, and to be carriers of His love to the people around us. I want to admit, I don't walk in that kind of love perfectly. And I think if we're all honest, we'd say we don't either. There's times where people test us. There are times when situations really get the best of us and we find ourselves not acting in the love of God. We say things that are hurtful. We do things that make people mad. We neglect the people we say we love. And so people one day, they begin to say, I'm tired of hearing you say you love me. Show me that you love me. Well, God wants us to understand the importance of love. Did you know that love is a gift? I can't make you love me, and you can't make me love you. But I can give you love as a gift. And to be honest, it is the greatest gift that we can give one to another. You know, when two people stand up here on wedding day, they are are covenanting their, their lives together. And what they're doing is giving to each other the most precious gift they can give. And it's not themselves... It is the love. Because there are people who live in the same house and can't stand each other. So the gift that they give each other, if if it is done in the true sense of what God ordained for marriage, they're giving each other that lifetime commitment to love one another. And I thank God for my wife. And she has given me her love. She gives it to me every day. It's, It's a reality that I walk in when I get up in the morning and when I go through the day, she doesn't have to love me, but she does. She has chosen to love me. She has given me that love for a lifetime. And I've given her my love for a lifetime. And oh, I tell you what, it's a wonderful gift to receive, and love is a wonderful gift to give. Have you ever given someone that gift of your love? And I know there's heartbreak when people don't really do things God's way and people can hurt and you can give them your gift of love and they may trash it and step on it and walk all over it. That's a hurtful thing. And Sometimes you want to hold back that love because you don't want to get hurt. Well, even then, the love of God is greater than the hurts we've experienced. Amen? Love is also a key. Now, you have to have a key to get in your house if you have a lock on your door. 
have to have a key to get in this church. There is a, there's a key to spiritual things. Jesus talked about that in Matthew chapter 16. says, I give you the keys of the kingdom. He's talking to the church. There are keys. The love is a key that unlocks the door on all the other virtues. Because all the other virtues, kindness, gentleness, self-control, peace, love, joy, all of these other virtues, are released as we begin to open up the door with love. Love is the key that unlocks the door. And God wants us to experience all of His blessings as we unlock the door with love. Do you know that's even true with people? People that may not like you, people that don't love you, people who could care less, but if you keep loving on them, you just keep, as they dish out the, uh, the bad, you keep responding in love. Do you know that sometimes... Not always, but sometimes that love will overcome the barrier in their life. Amen? Hallelujah. Do you believe that the love of Jesus changed your heart? A time when you were still His enemy and you really didn't care about Him? Oh, you might not have cursed His name. Some of, you, some of us did, you know, say His name in vain, things of that nature. But you know, God's love unlocked the key, unlocked the door. On our heart. Love is a selfless thing. However, the flesh, which oftentimes gets control of our life, it is selfish. Selfless is love. The flesh is selfish. Did you know that really all sin boils down to self? Self. What I want, what I need, who I am. It's the thing that the devil brought Eve down and Adam down. It's the very thing that brought down many, many people. It's this idea that I need, I want, I am, and you can have it by just getting what you want. Just get, get it yourself. It's a selfish attitude. All sin really boils down to a core of selfishness. And so that's why Jesus came along later and said, if you're going to follow Me, You've got to deny yourself. You've got to deny yourself and you've got to take up your cross and follow me. Because the way into the life of love is first through the death of self. We've got to die to selfishness. We've got to die to self-centeredness. The things that we want at the expense of everybody else. Did you know most arguments in a home or in a family or in a marriage usually have to do with what people want and what they're not going to give up. It's about selfishness. And we have to get to that point where love is selfless in our life. Love is the great commandment. Matthew chapter 22, verse 35 through 40. It says, Then one of them, a lawyer, meaning someone who studied the law of God, asked him a question, testing him, meaning Jesus, and said, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You see, that is what Jesus said is the great commandment. Love. Love for God and love for one another. Love for our neighbor. And if we are going to focus on all the other things that we're supposed to do and ignore the love commandment, we're going to fail at everything else. Love is the greatest commandment. Always has been and it always will be. The essence of the Christian life is to love God and to love others. More than anything else, we are to love God and, and that's why Jesus said it's the first. Because if you don't love God first, it's going to be hard to love anybody else. You can't love people without God's love being in your heart. I found that out the hard way. And so, we've got to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Him. And without love, and you think about it, all the other gifts that you receive in life, without love, those love... Those, those gifts become distorted and destroyed. 
right? I mean, just think of any gift any, in any relationship. If you take love out of the equation, it becomes distorted, defiled, and destroyed. Love is important. God has blessed us with so many things. But He wants our love for Him to be supreme. And once his, our love for Him is supreme, then we'll know how to handle all the other gifts that He gives us. Well, love is the supreme command of Christ. John 13, verse 34 through 35. Before Jesus was crucified, He met with His disciples there in the upper room and shared the Passover meal with them. And you know... The, the last words of Jesus before He goes to the cross would be, I think, some very important words. Jesus said this to them, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are My disciples if you have love one for another. I think it's interesting there that of all the things Jesus could have said, all the different commandments, He said this is the commandment, I believe this is the commandment of the new covenant, everything else derives from this one commandment, that is, that you love one another. And by what standard are we to love one another? By the Republican standard? By the Democratic standard? By the Baptist standard? By the non-denominational standard? What is the standard? Jesus said, as I have loved you. That means that any other standard of love that falls short of how Jesus Christ has loved us is not His kind of love. Now you just imagine how God has loved you, how Jesus Christ has loved you. I mean, just think that He went to the cross for you. Isn't that awesome? He laid down His life for us. In one place Jesus said, and this is what I want you to do is lay down your life for one another. Everybody today is trying to grab on to their life. You know, the beer com commercial says, grab for all the gusto you have, or you only go around once in life. You see, it's all about me. It's all about what I can get, the fulfillment of my life. But where is the kind of love that Jesus had that's in us by which we live our life, not for ourselves, but we live our life as a gift to God. We live our life as a gift to our family. We live our life as a gift to serve God and the people around us. The most miserable people in the world are the people who only think about themselves. I want to tell you right now, our country is in great disarray because everybody wants what they want. And nobody's willing to to lay down what they want for the good of their nation. John F. Kennedy, years ago, in his inauguration speech, says, do not ask what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. We've lost that in our country today. But folks, we've lost it in our families, and we've lost it in the church. Oftentimes, we come and we think, what? Can this church do for me? But when we ought to come and say, God, thank You for saving my soul and bringing me in, and God, what can I do for You? And I am so thankful that this church continues on because people have that kind of sacrificial love. When you think about people outside who look at us and they're trying to discern, determine whether we're real or fake. Many a times, people can't tell, unfortunately. But Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples. By what? By His kind of love demonstrated through us to one another. You think the world's impressed when they hear of Christians fussing and fighting in the church? You think the world's impressed? When they hear the fallout and church splits and all the different things that go on, no. The world's not impressed with that because they know the, the life of Jesus and they think even as 
Mahatma Gandhi had said, the leader of back in the days of the revolt in is a peaceful revolt in India years ago, when India was working for its independence from the British. And it is said that when he considered the claims of Christ, and he was he considered Christianity, he said this, I would be a Christian if I ever saw one. He could not reconcile the teachings of Christ with the way Christians were living. Folks, there's a lot of people out there that don't want to just hear about Jesus. They want to see Jesus. And for some people, we're the only Jesus some people are going to see. And so we've got to make sure that our life demonstrates that in the good times, but especially in the bad times. Because it's easy to show God's love when everybody's cool and nice and everything's wonderful. But it's a different thing when the pressure's on and when people are being mean and when people have done you wrong. When the love of Jesus comes out, they know this is not you. This is not normal. This is supernatural. This is the love of Jesus on display. And when they come and say, you know, you're such a nice person. Don't sit there and go, yeah, I guess I am. Because you're fixing to fall. When, you, when people see Jesus in you, you reflect the glory back to the one that they're seeing in you. Say, so, no, you don't want to see me. I'm not a nice person. But Jesus got a hold of me. And because of Jesus, I'm not the person I used to be. And I'm not the person I could be because I'm letting Jesus live in me And if you want to see me when Jesus is not in control, it's a different picture altogether. Amen? Hallelujah. We need to let people know that. Otherwise, they just think you're a good person. They need to know that there is a a love coming out of you that can also live inside of them. Well, Jesus said in 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. You see, love is that evidence that we are born again. The love of God is that evidence that we have been born again and that we know God. Love is not just a noun. I've said this in other messages. Love is also a verb. We talk about love. All we need is love as a noun. But love is not just something that we we put a noun on it and say, that is, that is love right there. We're looking at it. No, love is also a verb. And love is known by what love does. Amen? I mean, I can go around and tell you I love you all day. And then someone else could go around and show you they love you all day. And which one are you going to believe? The one who shows you they love you. So love is as love does. And so what we have to do is begin to put action to our claim. We need to begin to live out what we profess. We need not only to say we have love, but we need to show that love so others will say we have love. That's so, so important. Love is not... Something that we are, but love is a person. Love is a person. Love is God. He is the source of love. Look at 1 John 4, 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. That's the very essence of who He is. Now, we know He is holy. No one can approach Him in His holiness. He is unique in who He is. But He is the source of love. It's not going to, you're not going to find His love coming from a boy or a girl or a man or a woman or anything else. You're going to find the love of God coming like the sun rays from the sun. They're going to come from God. He is love. 1 John 4, 16 says, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in his love abides in God and God in him. 
So if we're going to experience God's love, we've got to come to God who is love. Maybe you've come to church, but you're not experiencing that love of God. Because see, the church cannot give you love as a source. We're not the source of God's love. We are carriers of His love, but we are not the source of God's love. Hopefully, when people walk into a church, they see people that are full of God who is love. And they experience that love of God coming out of them like a a vessel that's carrying that love and sharing it with the people around them. I want to be a vessel of God's love. And I'm thankful that when people walk into this church, one of the things that so many visitors say is, you have such a friendly church and you have such a loving church. Sometimes they don't even know how to handle it. Because they've not experienced that kind of love. And at first, they're a little gun shy. Like, uh, too many people saying hello. Too many people wanting to hug your neck and, and acting like your family and they just now met you. But that's just the love of God. That's the love of God. Folks, there's other ways in the Bible they say they, you know, greet one another with a holy kiss. We hadn't gone that far. But I want to tell you, I hope that when you come in, you're sharing God's love and you're receiving God's love. Give love as a gift and receive love back as a gift. Receive and give it back and forth from one another. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, love. I want us to look here at 1 Corinthians 13 very quickly. I tell you, this could be a series right here. But I don't have time for this to be a series, so I'm going to highlight it. First of all, I want to talk about love's priority. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Now, all of those things just described there are biblical and they are good in their right place. But what he is saying here is all of these things, if they are not motivated and carried along by love, can be an irritation. (laughs) Amen? You ever had people try to exercise spiritual gifts and it's all about them, not the people around them? I mean, it's an irritation. Like clanging brass. And a symbol that's just going off all at the wrong time. You see, he says, and without love, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I may think I'm something, but without love, I am nothing. And if I don't have love, no matter what else I do, it doesn't profit me anything because the motive is not love. If I were to give $1,000 today, and I made it all about announcing to the church, I'm giving $1,000. To God. Well, the church can use a thousand dollars. And if you got it, get with me after service. But when I'm up here trying to make a point about who I am and I'm so generous, guess what? It's not about love for God and it's not about love for the church. It's about love of the praises of man. That's right. Amen. So without love, it didn't didn't go into God's books up there as a donation into the kingdom of God. So what we have to understand is there's a priority on love. We must get love first in priority. Next, we want to see love's attributes. Verse 4 through 8 describes the love of God. Notice here it says, love suffers long. It's long-suffering. It's kind It does not envy other people. It does not parade itself, meaning it is boasting and going around trying to promote itself. It's not puffed up in pride. It doesn't behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked into anger and being upset. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity or sin, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears up under all things. 
It believes all things. It hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. Now is that normal human love? No. That is supernatural love. That is divine love. That is agape love. That is God's love. And that's what he's talking about here is we must have God's love. God's love is different than human love. I want to tell you, if you're looking for a, someone to marry in your life, find someone that's got God's love. A believer is supposed to marry another believer. And don't marry someone because they say they're a believer. Look for the evidence. If they only go to church with you just so they'll, you'll say, I do, they're not serious. Amen? If they just say, love, I love you, so they can take advantage of you, that is not love. Amen? Love that's going to carry you through a marriage and happiness is the love of God. And that love is not something you can give them. It's something they can only receive from God. And once they receive it, they will love God and they will love you as God loves you. Because humans love, human love is going to fail. There are going to be times in your marriage where it seems like the seams have all been pulled apart. But it is the love of God that will hold you together. You need God's kind of love. Also, love is enduring. Verse 8 says, love never fails. But whether there is prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. And then in verse 10, But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Now what's he saying? Right now we live in this current age before Christ comes back. One day we're going to see Him face to face. I look forward to that day. And I hope that I have used my life for His glory where He can be pleased with my life. But all the things that are a part of this present age aren't going to be needed in heaven. We're not going to need to speak in tongues in heaven. We're not going to need to prophesy in heaven. We're not going to need to somehow, you know, delve into all the knowledge and mysteries because once we see Him face to face, the light is clearly on. We don't need tongues. We don't need prophecy. We don't need all those things anymore because now we are in the fullness of His presence. Now, the only thing that's going to matter then is love. Love. So for us to focus on these other things that divide us and pull us away from the most important things are part of the devil's strategy. Do you know there's churches and people within churches that that get twisted in their relationship with each other? Fallings out over things that are going to pass away. But you know, if we'll make love the priority, the love that will never pass away, a love that we're going to experience now and carry on over into glory, that's what God wants us to focus on. Love is also complete. 1 Thessalonians 13, 9 says this, For we know in part, we prophesy in part. All these other things, we have a part. I have a, I have a partial understanding of things that one day I'm going to fully know. But love is complete here, and love will be complete there. God's love. If you want to walk in something that is totally complete, that you can experience right here and now, God's love is that. You don't have to wait to heaven to get to heaven to experience God's complete love. You can experience on this side of heaven. Amen? Also, love's maturity. Look at verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. What's he talking about? Love requires us to grow up. I didn't get a lot of amens on that. But love requires us to grow up. It it requires us to stop acting childish. To stop acting like little babies. To stop acting like little toddlers who are saying, my toy. Mine. It doesn't matter. They can be playing with one thing, but someone else, another kid grabs another toy and they drop that and they go over there and grab it and say, mine. 
You say, you laugh at them, but that was you too at one time, right? And you know that a person is growing to maturity when they stop, hopefully, talking about mine all the time. That would be terrible to be sitting at the lunch table and you start to get a piece of chicken and someone else stabs their fork and says, mine. That would be a very childish thing. But you know, it's amazing how much we sometimes act like that as Christians. So childish. So childish. And he talks about it here in three ways. In our talking, in our understanding, in our thinking. In the way we talk, in the way we understand things, and the way we think. We've got to grow up. And love will require us to grow up. We're not going to treat each other in childish ways. Once we grow up, we're not going to be quite as touchy, quite as offensive, quite as unforgiving. We're going to be more like Jesus. Amen? And I need to be more like Jesus. We need to be more like Jesus. So love has a maturity. Love has a transformation that takes place. Look at verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. That's in His presence when He returns. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. What he's saying here is there's coming a time where love is going to have its final transformation in our lives. How are we going to experience God's love? Is it just... You know, we wake up in the morning and God just, you know, gives us a, a, a download of love every day. Look, what we have to do is get into His presence. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of God, are being transformed. Everybody say transformed. Into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of God. How are we going to be transformed by His love? We've got to get into His presence. And we've got to get into His presence so we can experience His love. And that we can be transformed by His love. And that we can be downloaded with His love so that we can be carriers of His love to the world around us. I can't love you in my own capacity. I found that out a long time ago. I can't love you like you need to be loved. I don't love you like God wants me to love you. But God can help me to love you like you need to be loved. And how God wants you to be loved. And so that means I've got to receive it from God. And the best way is that I know is one time when that happened and I said, God, I can't love this person. God said, no, you can't, but I can. I died for this person. You let me love this person through you. You let me look through your eyes. You let me listen with your ears. You let me touch with your hands. You let me go with your feet. Let me speak through your mouth. Let me show them what my love is through you. Amen? Hallelujah. And then finally, love's greatness. Look in verse 13. And now abide faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. You see, love is like a two-railed train track. We have a train here in Rusk. Some of you may have ridden it, some of you may have ridden a train, but you know that a train is set on two tracks, train cars. Well, those two tracks are love. The love of God and the love for one another. And if we're going to experience anything with God, it's going to come on those two tracks. Amen? If things are going to come into the church, the, the train cars of God's blessing, the train cars of God's gifts, the train cars of God's provision, it's going to come in on the tracks of our love for God and our love for one another. Without love, without those tracks, we're not going anywhere. And if we fail... To continue loving, everything else will be derailed. And how many times we've seen tragic train accidents when the rails go awry. And how many times we've seen churches go through a wreck when love goes awry. 
Amen? God's up to some beautiful things in your life. God's into, up to some beautiful things in our lives. God's up to some beautiful things in the church. But let's make sure that love is the priority. Love is the greatest. It is the king of all virtues. Let love reign in your heart today. Let love reign in your life. And let love reign through you to the world around you. Amen? Amen. Well, it's time to receive God's love today. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to know today that Jesus Christ died because of love. It wasn't the nails that held Him on that tree. It was love that held Him on that tree. He loves you. And He died for you. But you must receive Him as your Lord and Savior. Will you bow your heart? Will you bow your knee to Jesus and call upon His name that you might be saved? You can be born again. And you can experience the love of God. And you can become a carrier of God's love today. Some of you today, you've gotten away from God, but God's calling you back. It's love. It's His love that's drawing you. It's His love that's calling you back. God is wanting us to cultivate that love, saying, God, I haven't been as loving as I need to be, but God, I want to be a channel of Your love. I want You to be able to carry the train cars of Your blessings to the people around me on the tracks of my love for You and my love for them, Your love for them through me. God's love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You today for the love that came down from heaven and revealed itself to us through the King of love Himself, Jesus, who died on the cross to make love real and to show us what love really is. I pray, Lord, that today those who have never received that love, they've never experienced the transformation of Your love in salvation, that today they would call upon the name of the Lord that they might be saved. I pray for those who've been away from You, God, that you're, by Your love You're calling them home today. It's time to come home. Others, Lord, Father, who just simply say, God, I'm not where I need to be. My, love li- my, love, my loving life is not where it needs to be. God, I pray that You'll help us all today, Lord, to allow Your love to so fill us that the people around us will know that we are Your disciples. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hi, my name is Keith Hassel. I'm the pastor here at Grace Fellowship. And I want to welcome you to the broadcast today. And I'm thankful that you took time out of your life to tune in and be a part of our service. I hope you enjoyed the praise and worship today. Our heart is to get into the presence of the Lord. And maybe you've already been touched by the Lord during this time. We have the Word that will be coming forth in just a few minutes, and so I hope you'll stay tuned as we get into the Word of the Lord that could change your life. I've heard it said that one Word from God can change your life forever. And today may be the Word you need to hear. During this time, our people are receiving an offering. They are receiving an offering to help carry on the work here in our church. It's important. It takes people praying. It takes people working. It takes people giving. It takes people of all kinds trying to get the gospel out. Jesus gave us a great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creatures. He told us to make disciples of all nations. And you know, it doesn't matter how big your church is. It doesn't matter how small it may seem you are in this world. If you take advantage of the opportunities God gives you, God will bless it and He'll touch the world with it. We're trying to touch the world right here from little old Rusk, Texas. We're not a big church, but that doesn't mean we can't have a big impact, especially when it comes to spreading the Word of God. You know, you can be a part of that today. You can give if God so puts it on your heart, and you can be a part of spreading the Gospel to the world around you. And how can you do that? Well, there's different ways. You can either mail in an offering to Grace Fellowship, P.O. Box, 260 Rusk, Texas, 75785. Or you can go to our website at www.gracefellowshiprusk.com. And there's a giving button right there on our website. 
There's also other articles and things that you can be blessed with there. You can also type uh, on your in a text GF Rusk to 77977. 77977. Just type in GF Rusk and he'll give you the information you need to get uh, a, an offering brought in. Or you can also get our church app. On your smartphone, just go to your app setting, your app store, and type in Grace Fellowship TX in parentheses, and it'll bring up a little red app. And you can go right there. Get that app, and you can watch us right there on the app. We're so glad that you've tuned in today, and we pray that during this service that God will touch and bless your life. And God will touch and bless other people's lives as well. And oh, by the way, if you're enjoying the service today, like it, share it, because others need to hear it too. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you.